I um, cannot thank you enough. And the funny thing is I put this uh, sound recorder down my back and now it seems to be traveling so southernly. <laughs> so if you notice unusual bumps, do not grow concerned. <laughs> it's, all in, it's all in order. Um, thank you, Christoph, and thank you, Helmut. Um, I have just had such a spectacular time at the Rachel Carson Center. I, I find it to be a true master class for ideas. I feel like every day I come here there's different ideas coming forward to me and, and then there are these incredible forums like the works in progress, like this colloquium that enable me to hear them and then think about my ideas in relationship to them. So I, I can't express my gratitude deeply enough. It's just been a wonderful time and it's wonderful because I have a few more months so whatever feedback you give me today would be most appreciated. I, I wanted to start by, by really asking you the question that you see behind you here. And if you wouldn't mind, just think about it for a, a moment or two and, and maybe turn to the person beside you and just share how you feel. Now I know Helmuth is always so good at stopping us. Now I see that it's, a, it's something about the magic of the room. Can I just ask if anyone would feel comfortable just sharing a couple of things that came up? I realize it's a very huge question and that the conversations were just getting started. But any, any things that came to mind? Yeah, Christine. I think we're both sort of saying we feel sort of polar feelings on the one hand. I think about being in nature and so on, like really happy and warm and wonderful feelings. Uh -huh. I think when you use the term the environment, there's mm -hmm. a lot of negativity attached to it and feel hopeless or um, <coughs> small, yes. yeah, small, in not very good way, and kind of, um, really in the middle. Okay. Thanks. And anyone else? Yeah. But I think, yeah, uh, um, the view of the environment always had that way. When it comes to kind of historical fact, when, when I, uh, no an environment for a long time and never probably I spent my childhood there and I see it destroyed afterwards. I have very strong emotional feelings. Mm -hmm. If I don't know an environment, my feelings uh, uh, may be more uh, loosely attached to it. Mm -hmm. So that familiarity in a specific context makes a difference. Yeah. Maybe one other person? Mm -hmm. Worried. Yeah. Okay. Um, I appreciate you sharing that, and I hope that you will continue to think about that question throughout the, this uh, discussion today and, and longer, because it's a question that's really shaping um, a lot of the work that I'm interested in. I think that feelings around the environment are something that, in our <coughs> world of looking at the uh, science of the environment we often leave out and as an environmental educator a few years ago I did a literature review of the environmental education research literature in the international journal that's the most common journal for that field and <clears throat> we could find only two references to feeling out of five years of, of journal articles so so we talk a lot about the knowledge of the environment but feelings are often left out I also became very interested in this question when I did some work at an international conference, um, a UN conference on the environment for children. And at that conference I was working with kids between the age of 10 and 14. And when I asked them this question, these kids came at the conference, they were coming from more than 92 countries. And the kids there came from highly impoverished areas, highly affluent areas, rural areas, urban areas. But the common, the most common answer I got to that question <laughs> looks something like that and was this word, dread in some form, dread, worry, uh, hopelessness, that really strong feelings. And I guess one could argue, well, of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things are bad. And this is just a wordle and I wanted to do a, a thank you to um, 
uh, Martin for giving me all the titles in the RCC library to make a Wordle from and this is a Wordle from the 2012 Times Higher Education Supplement of Climate Change book titles. And you can see very, very worrying situation. Things are bad. Um, the Rachel Carson Center right now is creating a publication on the Anthropocene, what some are calling a geological era in which humans are the dominant form on Earth, where they impact everything on Earth. This is by an Irish um, artist. His name is um, David Thomas Smith. And what he does is work with satellite photographs. This is from the Beijing airport. And then he puts them together in the same way as, as people who weave Persian rugs, trying to get us to look at the impact of humans on the Earth in perhaps a different way, a more artistic way. I'll give you a minute to read that. Look at the terms, misery, mutilated. This is from the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. It came out in 1992. I see Rob nodding. It's a document that is often referred to around that time when we were seeing a lot of international assemblages of scientists putting out calls like this. And I would say that our response to that has been primarily to scare people into action. This is an award-winning, um, this is from the exhibit, exhibition of the best social and environmental ads. Um, and a lot of these ads use children. So take a look at that and then let's see if this will work for us. Do we need to uh, push anything here? Let's see. Oh. Oops. Oops. Okay. Well, don't worry about that. <laughs> we had a little film clip. I don't think it's going to come through. Anyway, the end point of this sort of really con strong concern and then the way it's delivered come out in studies like this. This is a study from the International Journal of Mental Health Systems in 2012. And some of the work that I've been doing, which is to try and look at where is the evidence around this in terms of people's um, emotional responses to the environment. And so we start seeing all these new terms coming up, a new lexicon, a new language. So terms like environmental grief, environmental depression, environmental apathy, compassion fatigue. Um, and someone who many of you might be familiar with is a, is a man named Glenn Albrecht from Australia. He's a professor of sustainability. And he says, we simply do not have words available to us to express the very kind of thing you said. Solastalgia speaks to what you said. It says, it's solastalgia is when you're home for, homesick for a place and you're still there, but it doesn't exist anymore. So it's, it's trying to put labels on places or labels on feelings. Um, and he has a, a whole lexicon evolving. I think one of the other responses we see is not worry, but anger. <laughs> pretty interesting. This is from a Canadian study um, in 2013. And, and what we are seeing, of course, is the rise of a whole psychological field that's interested in this question, the field of conservation psychology. Some fascinating ideas coming out of that field. Um, as a person who works in environmental communication and environmental education, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to make people aware. And I think there's been this real belief, you know, if they knew better, they would act better. But one of the things terror management theory says is if you're really already concerned about something and I just keep telling you that it's a big problem, what you end up doing is you either shut down or you, you know, disregard it or you go the opposite direction and you may even go to hyper-consumerism because you have this idea, well, I might as well get it while I can because it's not going to be around. So how we respond to real issues is important because we may inadvertently, through our will intention, be causing the very actions that we are trying, in fact, to avoid. And in more recent years still, the whole field of neuroscience and brain plasticity is coming forward. And some of the work there which says, if you're afraid, if you're worried, 
um, two things tend to happen on a, on a strictly brain um, basis. One is you make much quicker decisions, and the second is you get really isolated. You don't give concern to other people. And it's the opposite of what uh, a number of people talk about when they talk about slow thinking. Slow thinking, which is that which I think the Rachel Carson Center engenders so well, which is a chance to really contemplate and think creatively and, and the things that we need to do if we want to create a more sustainable Earth. Um, and uh, Christoph was telling me about an interesting film that a friend of his made that is uh, perhaps available to have a look at called Speed that is addressing some of this kind of question. The other area where we're starting to see a result is hopelessness among scientists. There's a growing number of editorials coming out in major scientific journals and we're seeing a decrease in enrollment in conservation science in both Europe and in North America and in Australia. And Jeremy Jackson, um, a, a wonderful person for putting names on things, uh, a very well-known marine biologist says this, that, that what we've really done in conservation science, which started as a crisis discipline in the 1970s, is, is really become very good at recording loss and that we have to move beyond that. So for all these reasons, um, I would advocate that we need to shift this story beyond doom and gloom. It's, it's not that doom and gloom doesn't have a place, but right now it is a very dominant narrative and it has a lot of impact. How many of you feel like you recognize the narrative of doom and gloom? Yeah. And one of the many gifts of the Rachel Carson Center is it's given me a chance to think about what holds that narrative in the status quo? What are some of the historical elements that make it so dominant? And these are just a few that, that I've been able to look at in the time that I'm here. So what's coming out of this for me is this real interest in where do we move in the direction of hope and resilience, solutions orientation, and, and what are some of the story shifters that might have the capacity to do that? And again, coming from the Rachel Carson Center is an opportunity to try and look at these larger societal trends or movements and how might they be part of what, what is uh, the possibility around that question. So what I want to do with the remainder of time with you today, if it's all right, is, is just touch on three of them. Green impulse, the age of social networks, and agency in the other than human world. This so idea of a green impulse, uh, we see here a picture of soldiers in World War I growing gardens in, uh, in the trenches. I find that a moving picture. And right beside a, a military person from the Iraq war growing a garden. We see actions of people who, despite really, really difficult situations, continue to try to make a contribution. There's a wonderful book called Defiant Gardens, which is um, written by, sorry, Keith Helphand. He's a landscape architect, but he's been looking at examples of this green impulse um, in all kinds of different settings, uh, including ghetto gardens from very close to here. Um, this is a picture taken on the first day of the annual flower show in, um, in Afghanistan. Um, This is an example of a tree, which is one of the survivors of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. And it's one of 55 trees taken from a two kilometer radius that have been cared for consecutively since that bombing. And now it's, it's there and the trees are labeled and the story of what happened to them is there. Um, my work is more uh, tied often to the marine environment and I was lucky enough as a Rachel Carson Fellow to go to the International Marine Protected Areas Conference in France in October. And there is an incredible increase in the amount of marine protection going on on Earth right now. Um, Christoph mentioned that uh, brief that I had written for George Bush. Luckily it was his wife who really liked the idea and, and it happened. Um, anyway, but this, this movement to not just marine protected areas but ecosystem scale marine protected areas. So this impulse towards protection. And here's an example. This is photographs taken from the typhoon in the um, um, 
the Philippines just uh, in 2012 and we see what happens on land which is what we mostly see this is what happens to the coral reefs beside it but interesting work coming out of the University of Australia and um, sorry James Cook University in Australia and others that show that when there is a marine protected reserve close to those areas you get incredible resilience three to five years more fish bigger fish in a non-impacted area and eight to ten in a typhoon area so I think some really interesting ideas are around um, almost an emotional compulsion or a response and uh, you know E.O. Wilson Steve Keller talk about it in terms of biophilia but this whole idea of that we have a relationship the second area I just wanted to touch on is this great chain of being and this is a concept that really started with Aristotle and Socrates and has been sort of perpetuated it was a very very common in the Middle Ages to think that way and and I would argue that it's still very dominant in terms of our sense of who has agency who who is an actor in all of this um, especially when we look in here and then we start coming down here and so in the actions that I was showing you in this impulse um, a lot of times we're thinking about the agency of people right people to create create marine protected areas but I think there's a very interesting examples coming from the other than human world around this that challenged the idea of, of uh, the other than human world being not active agents so I'll ask you where do you think this is in the Pacific it's it's Bikini Atoll and you probably know it better as this it's the place where the uh, first atomic bomb tests were done in 1946 and that's how it looks today this picture was taken last year so it has now become a very popular diving area it's very rich for tropical fish has thriving coral communities where do you think these wolves live? Chernobyl. Chernobyl, right. So these wolves were featured in a really wonderful film called Radioactive Wolves, which was done by an Austrian filmmaker. And the perhaps surprising thing about this is that the wolves in Chernobyl actually have the highest reproductive success of any wolves in Europe right now. Now, the wolves are radioactive, and so are the pups but they have long-term survivorship and they have high reproductive success. Also really interesting things, baby fish learning to cope in high CO2 worlds, right? Clownfish showing an ability to not just perish when CO2 changes, but changing. And this from last year, <coughs> gorillas learning how to disable snares um, in places where that poaching effort is very intense. So I would advocate that we aren't the only ones actively responding to crisis. And that brings me to the last piece I wanted to touch on, which is this idea of social networks. So my, my good friend Fred Sharp is a whale biologist, and he's been studying humpback whales in uh, southeast Alaska. And what's fascinating about, one of the things that's fascinating about those whales is that every year they gather together and they do this incredible tool use thing where they blow bubbles collectively in order to trap fish. And you get 10 to 14 whales and they blow bubbles as, as small as peas all the way up to the size of pizzas and they make these huge nets. One whale at the bottom making a, a sound, the other whales blowing bubbles through their blowholes as they come rocketing to the surface, and then they all come flying up in the surface with their mouths open like this, and they consume these fish that are caught in these big nets. Um, what's amazing to me is that the same whales get together in this area. They come from very far away. They spend the rest of their time in, in Hawaii, Mexico, Japan. They come together and they do this communal tool use uh, hunting technique just for the f feeding time in, the, in Alaska. Um, what's also interesting is they have this sort of grass is always greener kind of thing. So if there's another group that appears to be catching more fish, some members will go over and they're kind of like, oh, I'd like to have a go with you, you know. So even though it's, and those whales are not related, okay? So it's not that they're brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles. These are unrelated whales who have chosen to 
hunt with each other on a regular basis for decades. Um, we know that the oceans are highly impacted by us. Um, Christopher Clark at uh, Cornell University says that the noise level in the ocean is doubling every decade. And so a whale that was born at the, in 1945 could hear a thousand miles and can now only hear a hundred miles, which is a big issue when you're an animal that communicates with these other members auditorially. So one would say, ah, however, social networks between whales are actually helping whales, humpbacks, recover from 1,500 to 20,000 in 40 years. And Fred Sharp would say, it's because of this ability to sort of see what others do and how they, how they respond and therefore take different strategies that is actually enabling them to access collective knowledge in a way that enables them to have higher success. So whale social networking is, to me, fascinating. And then just recently, while I was here at the Rachel Carson Center, I, I found research around plants social networking. Um, some of you may be well familiar with this, but this idea of mother trees comes from Suzanne Samarda at the University of British Columbia. So the idea that very large trees are connected. So if you're going for a walk in the English garden after you leave here, I hope you do, um, and you look at a tree, that tree is connected through its root, uh, its root um, assemblages through fungus to other roots as far as you can see trees. And not just trees that are of its same species or even of its same family, but different species as well. And these trees have the capacity not just to be passively enacting that way, but to redirect their energy um, to other trees. So when a tree is dying, it sends its energy out to other trees that surround it. It's an, it's an active agent. And some work done um, looking at forestry question, you know, if you clear cut everything or you leave these areas with mother trees, you get a much higher success of, of, recoup of recovery. Nine years when you have the opportunity to have the trees actually participating. And then of course social networking ourselves. Um, this is a really interesting map. This is from October to November 2012 showing tweets uh, in Europe. And the tweets are in different colors to show different languages. This shows who's using social networking sites. This is from a 2000 and uh, three Pew study. This is just a North American sample. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is look across income level, look across gender, look across um, urban, suburban, rural. Huge saturation of social networking going on. And then if we we're to look at the world internet usage, just take a look at the growth and usership in this growth column here. So one of the things I think is fascinating about that is the opportunity to move. One of the reasons people hate environmentalists, if we go back to that study, or one of the reasons environmentalism doesn't speak to a lot of people is that it's been cast by many as a white middle class identity. And the social networking enables us to really look at what is going on now in terms of a community orientation and coming up um, lots of different groups now coming up as environmental startups and others that are very specifically interested in different uh, racial and cultural identities, religious identities. And also some fascinating things when we come to the ideas of, of how we govern and think about our response to the planet. Um, Ideas like crowdsourcing the world's goals instead of, of uh, just looking at expert reports, doing those, but then looking, what do we collectively decide we should do? There's a fantastic program that you can get on your phone right now through the London Zoological Society 
that has real-time cameras on water holes in different parts of Asia and Africa and it's a citizen science project where you can look on it and see what you see and then you send that information in and it helps them do biological inventories. They're actually using the scientific data collected in that way. The bottom example is from someone I met at the International Marine Protected Areas Conference who was telling me that one of the big problems they have in the Great Barrier Reef because it's such an enormous area um, and some of the other Australian parks is people don't know when they're in a marine protected area. Right? They really don't know. And now they have this uh, system where your phone will beep you to tell you when you're there and will then also invite you to share observations that you're making about what you're seeing in that area at that time. <clears throat> and I think this social networking potential also is playing out in terms of ourselves as individuals. It's enab enabling a highly personalized response. Some of you may know this. Do, do some of you know this uniform project? This is a young woman who decided she would uh, make one dress and wear it for 365 days but, but show it in all different styles and all different uh, ways as a way of raising money for uh, schools in, of, for girls in India and uh, created a huge internet following and all these copycat campaigns. Um, the people on the right there uh, were looking at the issue of uh, shark fin soup at weddings and trying to make it popular to not serve shark, shark fin soup by showing pictures of their own wedding and their friends' weddings and now it's grown into quite an active uh, program in many parts of the world. So the project that I am working on that's coming out of all this is a project called Circumnavigating Hope, the same as the title of this talk. And I'm working with the London Zoological Society and the Smithsonian Institute. Um, Jeremy Jackson, and who I had mentioned was talking about moving beyond the obituaries, he and Nancy Knowlton, another coral reef biologist, have started doing these workshops at international scientific conferences where they ask people for just one day to tell only hopeful stories about the environment that have a true conservation outcome, successful outcome. And it's, they have been inundated by examples which don't find their way into the scientific literature because if we go back to that slide where I was looking at what, you know, what holds that narrative in the status quo, it also holds the narrative in our publishing history in scientific journals. So that project is underway and what this project is about is, is gathering these examples of true conservation success outcomes and putting them in a way that is, is socially networked so that we have the opportunity for people not only to learn from these examples but also to try and shift this narrative by showing across um, marine and land-based uh, examples and internationally that, that these successes exist, that there are hopeful things there and that, that some of our assumptions around agency are things that need to be questioned. The other work that I'm doing while I'm here is I'm writing a book about this and then I specifically decided to write it as a personal narrative because again I think part of our age of personalization which is one of the things that's emerging out of this socially networked world that we are existing in is, is the privileging again of story and that my influence on you is most effective if you trust me, if you can relate to me, if you feel like my story somehow relates to your story, the story you told relates to me as did Christine. So, um, and this is the first line of that book. This picture I find very moving in light of Cameron's talk where he was talking about broken places. This is a spider web that comes from a scientist who's doing work in Chernobyl. And if you look at it, it's very damaged here. This was taken last year. Spiders in Chernobyl, in some places, we've distorted nets. But if you are standing there and you look, you can see a distorted net here and a perfect net here. And when I look at that, I, I, it makes me think about this. Is that beautiful? Is it broken? Is it um, becoming more resilient? Is it resilient? I, I guess I no longer can see these things as either or. I think they're all woven together as spider webs are. Um, and I would.
be really interested to know how you feel about it. And I thought I would end with this slide. In my experience of talking about hope and resilience, I tend to get these two responses very often. If I speak about hope, I must not know how bad things are. I sometimes get to go on radio call-in shows or television call-in shows, and as soon as I say something hopeful, even if I say, you know, I spend my life working on marine contamination issues or those things, people always tell me something worse. They call in and, and try to impress upon me the doom and gloom story. And then the second one is one that I've heard often, and, and Nicole very kindly, I don't see you now, Nicole, articulated it at our work in progress session is, is if we talk about this resilience, am I somehow saying that it's okay for those wolves to be radioactive, or it's okay that we create these circumstances in which this happens? So I thought I would end there, and I'm very happy to answer any kind of question and I also would be very, if, if these questions intrigue you or you'd like to, to discuss them collectively, I'd, I'd be grateful for that too. So, I'll stop there.